which means it's now time for oral questions. Just, uh, I recognize just, uh, before we start, we just member for Timmins is a point of order. Yes. Okay. Is the Premier going to be attending question period? Because if he's going to be late, we'd like to stay. To make reference to the absence of any member. Again, it is now time for oral questions. Unanimous consent to stand down my leads if the Premier is not here and, and wait till the Premier arrives. Leader of the Opposition is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to stand down the lead questions for the Opposition. Agreed? No. I heard a no. Wow. Once again, it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began early, uh, uh, nearly rather, 1,800 seniors have lost their lives in Ontario long-term care homes. 1,800 seniors losing their lives in long-term care homes in our province, and countless more have suffered neglect, have suffered abuse, and even starvation. Yesterday, the Premier repeated his claim that Ontario did not fail residents in long-term care homes. The Premier has refused to hold himself and his minister accountable. Long-term care facilities are licensed by this province. Can the Premier tell us whether any will lose their licenses, and if so, which ones? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. For 15 years, the long-term care sector was neglected and ignored. Our government created a Ministry of Long-Term Care in the summer of 2019, and in just a few months, we had already begun the good work, the necessary work to transform long-term care. We understood the staffing crisis, and we had an expert panel working on that. We understood the capacity issues. We are at 99% capacity. and and even increasing with unconventional spaces to meet demand, demand that had grown to a wait list of 30, 30, 37,000 people uh, under the 15 years of the previous Liberal government supported by the NDP. Our government was actively working on solutions, and then COVID hit. And the good work that we are doing now will continue to transition to a 21st century long-term care system. The lives lost must not be in vain. The suffering, the hardship that COVID-19 has caused, we will continue to transition to create the necessary changes needed to support residents in long-term care now and in the future. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, when the government won't admit its own failure, I don't know how anybody can trust the commitments that this minister is stating today. <laughs> to date, not a single home has lost a license despite levels of neglect so severe that the police have had to be notified. Orchard Villa is a for-profit facility operated by Extenda Care, the same company that recently hired the Premier's campaign spokesperson to lobby on their behalf at Queen's Park. Canadian Armed Forces reported that that facility was infested with cockroaches. Residents were being left in soiled diapers, and one person literally choked to death while being fed lying down. The Premier finally got dragged into taking control of that facility after workers and families spent weeks and weeks pleading for intervention, and 69 seniors died. Question. Will the for-profit corporations making money from Orchard Villa lose their license to operate that facility? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. The issues surrounding licenses are complex and largely involve the lack of capacity that was uh, really a responsibility of the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP. The capacity issues in our long-term care system were being addressed in a fulsome way, in an active way, when COVID hit. The solutions to long-term care require a modernization of our system, an integrated system that is being planned and worked on as we speak with Ontario Health, Ontario Health teams, the good work that is being done. There is the, the, the duty of care of our long-term care homes is non-negotiable. They must keep our residents Response. safe. 
The global pandemic of COVID-19 has caused hardship around the world. Our government is taking action and will continue to take action to fix this issue. Thank you. The final supplement, please. Issues of neglect leading to death are not complex. They're pretty straightforward. Nearly 300 seniors have died in homes owned by Siena Incorporated, the for-profit long-term care uh, 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 home that recently hired several Conservative insiders and for the Ford government staff to lobby on their behalf. Siena ran ultimate facility where the armed forces found residents de were denied meals and completely unprotected, were left completely unprotected from COVID-19 when it came a knocking. And their senior executives were the ones that mocked families that were expressing outrage and grief. Siena is licensed to operate 37 long-term care facilities in our province. Will they lose a single license? Will there be any consequences whatsoever? Speaker for these homes. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. Ontarians do have questions, and that is what we are going to address with the, the public commission, public input, public hearings, and a public report. There are processes in place to deal with that, this, appropriate processes. Those processes must be followed. We are looking at processes that will enable our homes to transition from old 1970s built homes with wardrooms. And I can tell you that those wardrooms were part of the problem. The redevelopment that languished for 15 years and since uh, 2011, only 611 beds were built under the previous Liberal government supported by the NDP. Our government took long-term care seriously and was addressing the long-standing issues that had been neglected for so many years. Our government is the government that takes long-term care responsibly. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. My, my next question is also for the Premier, but I have to correct the Minister because people are not just having questions. Ontarians are horrified. They are outraged, and they are grieving the loved ones that they have lost in long-term care. Almost 1,800 deaths in this province. Sure. Yesterday, the Premier indicated that he's considering, literally, he indicated that he is considering proposals now by long-term care lobbyists to limit the legal liability for the spread of COVID-19 in their facilities. Can you believe that? He's going to actually help them get through this and not be held legally responsible. We know that several families have filed statements of claim detailing horrific levels of neglect and carelessness against for-profit facilities, including Siena, who referred to these claims as, and I quote, blood-sucking lawsuits. These Question. are the folks that the Premier is getting prepared to protect, not the seniors that lost their lives in long-term care. So can the Premier tell us which for-profit lobbyists he, his ministers and staff have met with to discuss this? Thank you. The Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker, I, I haven't met with any lobbyists, so I don't know where the opposition is coming up with this. But I want to compliment our Minister of Long-Term Care that has more experience than all the opposition folks combined. <laughs> combined. It's easy to play the armchair quarterback, but we're actually getting something done. As they sat there, as the leader of the opposition sat there for 10 years and did absolutely nothing to protect long-term care homes, they built 611 beds in 10 years? You've got to be kidding me. So it's pretty rich to hear the, the opposition leader sit there and criticize us when we're actually getting things done. We're fixing a problem that they destroyed for 10 years with their buddies, the Liberals. That's the real problem. This didn't just pop up overnight, Mr. Speaker. This has been ongoing for decades, decades, and they were part of the problem. Response. We're going to fix the problem. Supplementary question. This Minister of Health is a Minister of Health that's on the record wanting to privatize more of our health care system, so I have no confidence whatsoever that she's going to take to task these private operators of long-term care. For many families, launching a legal challenge was the only way that they could protect their loved ones in long-term care homes, because this government was dragging its feet. In April, while the Premier was insisting that there was an iron ring around long-term care, which there was not, family members of residents of homes like Eaton 
Greenville, Altamont and Forest Villa were detailing the very dangerous conditions that their loved ones were enduring. They went to court to fight for their loved ones while the government refused to act. That is the fact, and the Premier cannot deny that that is the fact. Why, then, is the Premier offering legal protection to homes that didn't protect their residents? The Premier. I'll, I'll give you the, the facts, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Because of the job that we have done, and it's a tragedy what's happened because of the systemic problem that's happened over decades, as they sat by and did absolutely nothing, we saved hundreds and hundreds of lives by going in there, <laughs> testing the frontline workers, testing all the, the patients, making sure we, we were after the, the people with asymptomatic uh, symptoms. So we were able to catch them. And even one of the long-term care homes, the, the frontline folks, I talked to you once and said, you know something? The best thing you did is actually test the people that were asymptomatic. That saved lives. We ended up getting hospitals in there to make sure the long-term care patients were protected. We ended up asking the military to come in to support us. But the good news is, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue doing it until it's fixed. We aren't going to sit on our hands Response? for 10 years like the Leader of the Opposition did. The final supplementary. Spe uh, speaker, the Premier's right in one thing. They ended up finally getting dragged into doing something proactive to protect seniors in long-term care, and it took them far too long. It's clear that the Ford government would rather defend for-profit long-term care homes than the residents who live in them. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, that she took swift and decisive, decisive Order. action in long-term care. But when we joined the frontline workers who called for the government to take control over these properties, uh, properties that uh, back in April, these facilities, the minister dismissed that request. It's on the record. And she said other provinces do things differently because other provinces were much quicker to respond. It was six weeks before the government finally began taking over homes. And during those six weeks, 1,370 residents Order. died. And now it looks like the government's moving to protect for-profit care once again. Why Question. is the government protecting for-profit long-term care facilities from legal liability rather than pulling licenses from the for-profit long-term care homes that have so brutally failed our seniors? Response? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you once again for the question. Looking back at what has transpired over the last several months, I can tell you with great clarity, our government took early action beginning in February 3rd, despite the narrative from the opposition to address the issues that we were confronted with. And the reality was, after many years of neglect, our homes Order. were in tremendous pressure capacity-wise and in a staffing crisis. We took early measures active screening, essential visitors only, and that was a hard decision to make, but it was necessary. Working with our hospitals, integrating, and that is really a key point. Understanding how we tra tra transition from the past to the future, to allow an aging population to get the care they Response. need. New thinking is required, and that's exactly what our government is working on as we speak, transitioning our long-term care system to a modern long-term care system. Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Speaker, last week the Premier was forced to backtrack and told the Assembly, and I quote, of course there's systemic racism in Ontario. There's systemic racism across this country. A lot of us have never walked a mile in someone's shoes who has faced racism, uh, is what the Premier said. Over the last week, thousands upon thousands of black and indigenous people have spoken out about their experiences with racism, particularly when it comes with interactions uh, with police. Does the Premier believe that systemic racism exists in, in policing in Ontario? And if so, what is he prepared to do about it? Premier, through you, Mr. Speaker, I think we all understand and recognize that policing and community safety has changed in the last number of years. The issues we face today by police services and the communities they serve are increasingly complex. As part of our government's $174 million commitment to address mental health and addiction this year, this Ministry of Solicitor General and the Ministry of Health announced $18.3 million in new funding to support those affected by mental health and addiction challenges in the justice sector. 
This includes $6.95 million, Mr. Speaker, for new mobile crisis teams and with dedicated safe beds and transitional case managers. I think we all understand that when almost 40 per cent of the police calls are interacting with individuals Response. who have mental health or addiction issues, we need to do things differently, and we're going to do things differently, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, last week the Premier said he was prepared to listen to and understand from the experiences of others when it comes to systemic racism. Here's what they're telling us. They want investment in mental health supports, not a $335 million cut. They want investments in youth outreach programs, not cuts to community-based outreach programs. Uh, they want uh, investment in anti-racism initiatives, not a cut to the anti-racism directorate and a, a truncating of the work that they're doing. And they want effective police oversight, which we don't have now in the province of Ontario, because instead the government has cut all of these programs and defiantly rolled back police uh, oversight, uh, a public rather um, oversight, uh, as one of the premier's first acts in office. If the premier means what he says about systemic racism, will he undo any of these decisions? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to take this question. Uh, on behalf of our government and our Premier has made uh, investments, particularly in the Black Youth Action Plan, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we have taken steps to bring forward a new council that's been advising the Premier and our government when it comes to youth opportunities. Uh, the Premier's Council on Equality of Opportunity was announced a couple of weeks ago with uh, Jamil Giovanni, who is the uh, province's advocate for community opportunities, working with young people, working with Black-led organizations as part of our Black Youth Youth Action Plan, Mr. Speaker, which, fu which funds about 50 different black-led organizations, not all black-led, but many black-led organizations in and around the GTA and Ottawa and right across the province, Mr. Speaker. We've also made an added investment in that program as a result of COVID-19 and some of the challenges in those communities when it comes to creating opportunities. One and a half million dollars was announced a couple of weeks ago Response. to give these programs that are providing these services in our community the boost that they need so that we can help more people get the equal opportunity that they deserve. Thank you very much. Well Next question, the member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, Ontario is home to a thriving agricultural sector. From dairy to poultry to delicious fruits and vegetables, good things really do grow in Ontario. Our agriculture sector continues to work around the clock to make sure we have access to high quality and safe food during the pandemic. But as we all know, the agriculture sector has been hit hard during the COVID-19 outbreak, especially temporary foreign workers. Premier, could you please share with the House what supports we have put in place to help these vitally important workers? Premier. Well, I, I want to thank the member from Aurora, Oak Ridge, Richmond Hill, MPP Parsa has done an incredible job up there, Mr. Speaker. He really has. I hear it from his constituents. And, and I, I, I want to acknowledge, uh, on behalf of all Ontarians, I want to extend my deepest condolences to the families and friends of the two farm, uh, farm workers who, who passed away from COVID-19. Our government knows that agriculture workers play a vital role in Ontario. Since the start of COVID uh, outbreak, Mr. Speaker, we've put a number of programs to, to help these vital workers, including most recently a $15 million investment to help farmers better protect their employees. We've been in contact with these farmers on a, on a constant basis. I know our Minister of Agriculture has reached out to them. I have personally reached out to them and, and talked to them. Nothing is more important to us as a government, as the people of Ontario, Spons. to protect the workers and protect the farmers because we rely on them to put food on our table, Mr. Speaker. And with, with the $15 million, they're going to be able to buy extra PPEs. They're going to make sure that they don't live in a congregate uh, living setting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is once again to the Premier. Sweet Premier, thank you very much for the update. I agree that workers are extremely important, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our government has been resolute and steadfast in ensuring that the health and safety of all workers in this province is never compromised. Our announcement yesterday regarding the new general uh, workplace guidelines is about giving businesses and owners the tools and resources they need to adapt and succeed in this new reality. This set of standards will help ensure that everyone feels safe 
in their place of employment because at the end of the day, nothing is more important than protecting Ontarians. Premier, can you please explain to the, to the House again the highlights of our announcement? Premier, I remember once again that nothing is more important to our government than making sure we protect the frontline workers, all workers across this province. And that is why yesterday we unveiled a new Ontario General Workplace Guidance document to help employers develop a robust safety plans to protect workers and, and patrons. Mr. Speaker, this toolkit builds on many supports we have already pro provided to businesses to help them prepare to reopen including over 133 sector-specific workplace uh, safety guidelines and, and documents, Mr. Speaker. Again, we are focused on making sure we protect the, the workers and the customers, be it a retail store or any other area that they interact with the public. It's our number one priority, and I'll tell you, we're doing one heck of a job. Response. I hear it out there, and that's why we're leading North America with the lowest cases anywhere in North America. I know it hurts you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario's agriculture uh, sector is now in the middle of one of the biggest uh, workplace COVID outbreaks in the province. And despite what the Premier just said, other countries aren't sharing the confidence in Ontario because Mexico announced yesterday that it was considering not allowing more workplace, more workers to come to Ontario because of the dangerous conditions they face. And Mexico did specify Ontario because they're still allowing, they didn't say that they weren't going to disallow workers coming to BC because they have faith in what BC is doing to protect their citizens. This is not only a tragedy for the workers in Ontario, but it could be a long-term disaster for the agriculture sector because confidence is key. And when other countries are losing confidence in how we protect our workers, which happen to be their citizens, that's a disaster. Question. What is this government going to do to mitigate that so workers in this province who deliver our food actually feel safe? Minister of Health. Well, I, I thank the member very much for that question. It is a very important one and one that we've been devoting a lot of time to in the Ministry of Health. The migrant workers are essential for food production in Ontario. We depend on them. And they have come into Ontario, they have self-isolated for 14 days, and they have gone into work and they have become ill. We need to keep working on that. We need to do the testing. I know there has been a testing facility that has been set up in Leamington. However, as of Sunday, I'm informed that there were only four people that attended. So clearly, we need to uh, revise the work that we're going to do. We're going to start doing testing with mobile units. We want to make sure that we can work with Ontario Health and with the OMAFRA to make sure that we can uh, reach all of the migrant workers who have been affected by COVID. I can tell you Response. that the, the uh, assessment has already been done of the high-risk cases, and they are being treated. But I will have more to say in the supplemental. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you for the response, but it bears repeating that the Mexican government has faith in BC, but not in Ontario. And in direct response, why migrant workers aren't coming to your testing? Because they have to get in a bus and go to Leamington. And the one thing that people don't realize about migrant workers is they aren't in control of their own destiny. They are, unlike everyone else in this room not in control. Their sponsor is in control. We asked over a month ago for the government to make sure that those frontline workers had full access to PPE. And we all know in these issues, and we should have learned it from long-term care, that time is of the essence. The government knew this was going to happen. They were warned this was going to happen. And they're still now, you're now you're talking about Question. putting mobile testing sites in? Why didn't you realize where the, pr where the problem was, and why didn't you a month ago, a month and a half ago, make sure that these migrant workers had access? Thank you. Members, please take your seats. Minister of Health to reply. 
Thank you, Speaker. We are working diligently, as I said before, with Ontario Health and with OMAFRA to make sure that the uh, farm owners will uh, open the farms to allow people to be tested. We are looking at a hybrid model where we will have some mobile testing. I've been advised that we were to do this just with mobile testing. It would take 84 days of testing in order to make sure all of the local farms in the Windsor-Essex area, for example, were covered. It would take 10 days in an assessment centre. So we need to work in collaboration with the owners of the farms to make sure that all of the migrant workers can be tested. But in addition to that, as the Premier has indicated and has been indicated previously, we are putting $15 million into more personal protective equipment, more into infection control and prevention, and more into revising workplace standards Response. so that people will be able to be separated apart in both the uh, where they sleep as well as where they work. So we are doing everything that we can right now to re sure Mexico and the rest of Ontario that we are doing our best to make sure thank you very much the next question the member for Simcoe Gray uh, thank you speaker my questions uh, for the Minister of Health last uh, Friday the uh, cystic fibrosis community was surprised and thrilled to learn that after years of fighting the pan Canadian pharmaceutical Alliance finally agreed to begin negotiations with uh, vertex pharmaceuticals on a purchasing price for Kaleidico and Orcambi, and congratulations to the minister and the government for that progress. <laughs> Access to these life-saving drugs, drugs will make a huge difference in the quality and length of life for thousands of Ontarians and indeed Canadian children and young adults. Negotiating with Vertex is an important first step. Can the minister put a timeline on these talks, and will the minister provide assurances that when the drugs become available, Ontario will list both Kaleidical and or Camby. The Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much to the member for the question. I know this is of uh, great importance to you, as it is to me. And we know that those uh, people living with cystic fibrosis are very hopeful that these new drugs will provide the relief that they're looking for and relieve some of the stress that they have to deal with each and every day and uh, are going to provide, uh, uh, will be available soon. We are very pleased to understand that the conversations are continuing between Vertex and the PCPA. I wish that I could give you a timeline, but I'm not able to do so because there are many other parties at the table, not just Ontario, that are having these discussions. But the fact that they are together at the table again is very hopeful. It is something I can assure the member that we are following very diligently because we are also um, very happy to move ahead should they be able to resolve some of the issues Response. that remain in discussions between them. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you uh, again. Back to the minister. Thank you to the minister for that answer. I guess I would just urge you, as you know, uh, I've raised the case many, many times over the last uh, three years. Sasha and Jamie LaRock are the uh, parents of uh, young Joshua, and Joshua's older brother is on Orcambi and does very, very well. His younger brother uh, is up at night coughing and uh, can't go out of the house, can't have a vacation. Uh, Obviously, the parents and many parents across Ontario are very, very worried during this time of COVID-19, which is also a, a disease or a virus that affects the uh, affects breathing. Um, Minister, given that you're going to be the largest purchaser, you in Quebec, and I'd be happy to talk to people in Quebec. I happen to know the minister and happen to know most of them. So if that helps you, I'll do that. Um, you're going to be the, like, the largest purchaser of Arcambi and Trifecta and uh, Kaleidico uh, when, uh, when eventually they're... Uh, they're on the market. Uh, uh, can you do everything in your power to just speed up the uh, Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance? Um, you're their number one customer, so Question. I think they would listen to you if you, uh, if you gave them a real push. Minister of Health. Thank you. Yes, I can certainly assure the member that we are doing everything that we can to move the conversations forward, uh, both with respect to uh, Kaleidico, with Orcambi, and with Trikafta as well. We know that different types of drugs work better for people with different types of cystic fibrosis. It depends on the strain that they have, but this is something that I know is very important to you. It is very important to me. It's very important to many members here that have constituents that have cystic fibrosis. There is nothing more more than any of us would like then to make sure that the family that you mentioned, as well as many other families across Ontario, um, have a, uh, a happy summer with their family members being able to breathe easily. 
and that is something that we are continuing to follow this file very diligently, and we will do everything that we can to move this process forward expeditiously. So thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. I'm a member of the Standing Committee of Finance and Economic Affairs, and our committee has heard directly from tourism, festival and event operators from across the province. They're pivoting their operations, and many of them are moving online this year. We heard that digital was the way to go. I know it's something our government has taken action on. Ontario has a new virtual platform that allows Ontarians to experience all that their province has to offer, all from the comfort of their own living rooms. Can the minister please tell this House how our government is supporting artists and operators looking to provide their customers and supporters with a digital experience? Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to say thank you to the member from Peterborough Kawartha uh, for his great question. And I think it's important, given the fact that the, the suite of sectors we're responsible for represents about $75 billion in normal times in economic activity and has taken at least a $20 billion hit through this pandemic. Uh, we used to be called the world in one province. I still call it. We welcome the world to our province when it is safe to do so, but right now we can only do it virtually. So we decided in March at the ministry to invest in a virtual portal called Ontario.Live so that we could bring arts, culture, sport and hospitality to people's homes uh, across the province of Ontario. And let me tell you what you can experience there, Speaker. The Art Gallery of, uh, of uh, Algoma, the Bay of Quinte uh, virtual activities, the Scandinavia Spa in Blue Mountain, the Adami Estates uh, in Orangeville, uh, the Response. Royal Ontario Museum, a thousand islands, helicopters and, Mr. Speaker, something we like to call music together, which we invested $150,000 in so that artists across this province could perform from the safety of their own home. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's nice to know that Ontario's artists have an avenue of support through these unprecedented times, and that Ontarians also have an avenue to enjoy a concert in the comfort of their own home. Mr. Speaker, the minister, however, also noted Ontario Live is not only streaming music concerts, but it's also growing a collection of other sites and attractions for Ontarians to check out virtually. Our government is committed to supporting some of our province's hardest hit sectors through this pandemic. In fact, C.D. Howe Institute has stated that four of the seven hardest hit industries were aligned with this ministry. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please shed some light on the future of Ontario Live and how it will continue to grow and support some of our hardest hit sectors and businesses throughout our economy's reopening and our long-term recovery. Minister of Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, this uh, site is still in its infancy. However, it has garnered great success across the province, and we have been able to attract 176 of uh, our various heritage organizations and our over 360 uh, public libraries that we support and 166 uh, uh, community museums. And we've asked them to provide their uh, digital content online. And I was pleased at visiting with my uh, colleague from Leeds and Grenville, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, uh, to go to the Brockville Community Museum and see for myself uh, that they are taking part in this. In 2017, live performances in Ontario contributed to more than $1 billion in Ontario's uh, economy and over 22,000 jobs, which is why our small investment of $150,000 has been important to leverage at musictogether.ca, which is part of Ontario Live, so that we can continue to uh, support our Ontario artists so that they can not only make it big here at home, but make it big around the world. And that's what we've Response. done, Speaker. We're committed to making sure that all of those in the heritage, sport, tourism and culture industry sector are supported at this time, despite being hit first, hardest, and will take longest to recover. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Acting Premier. Landlords and tenants alike are frustrated with this government's failure to provide direct rent supports and with the Premier's rather short-lived view that tough talk was enough to pay commercial rent. In Kingston, business owners and landlords have dedicated weeks of staff time trying to navigate a poorly designed, broken program. Others have applied only to not receive their login keys, and they cannot proceed with their applications until they get them. All across the province, businesses haven't been able to get the support they need, and they are facing eviction. The program is an abject failure, but now the Premier wants to double down. Why did this government refuse to listen to business owners and advocates? 
Why does he think tying an eviction ban to an already broken program is actually going to help any businesses in Ontario? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing Group. Speaker, I, I just can't understand what this official opposition stands for. They ask question after question after question about doing an eviction ban for businesses in the province. Many other provinces have joined uh, our call. We've indicated that we were going to uh, be bringing in legislation that, if passed, would provide exactly what the Premier said in his press conference on June the 3rd. And now the opposition, it appears, you know, I don't know, they, they issue a press release a couple of days ago and say one thing, they say something else in the House today. What, pick a position. You know, make a decision on whether you're going to stand with business like our government is or whether you're not. Pick a lane. Pick a lane. Order. Supplementary question. Speaker, and, and back to the acting premier. Uh, with all due respect, we have picked a lane, and that's to be on the side of small businesses across Ontario who need order right now. Order. Your commercial, the government's commercial eviction ban is too late and covers far too short of a time frame. It should be a blanket ban that goes back to the very beginning of this crisis because landlords are simply backdating their eviction notices for the day before it's supposed to take effect. It does not help small businesses. Uh, businesses in my riding continue to feel the impact of COVID-19, and it's going to last through the summer. They are losing a tourist season. The students are not coming back to Queens. They are not coming back to St. Lawrence, and they are not coming back to RMC. These businesses need ongoing supports, and this eviction ban Question. will not be enough. It doesn't cover enough time. Will the Premier redesign the commercial rent support program and ensure that businesses have the protection that they need to help reboot our economy permanently? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I, again, uh, Speaker, I, I cannot for the life of me understand the NDP. Member after member after member have asked for a commercial eviction ban, just like the NDP government in British Order. Columbia has, has implemented. You know, last week, Saskatchewan, Alberta, at the same time that, that our government Order. announced it, more and more, or more and more provincial and territorial governments are considering this. You know, again, the, the NDP keep asking for this. We finally give it to them, and they're now confused. they're not satisfied. They're very confused. Minister, uh, Speaker, I just can't understand where the NDP stand no, on this issue. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of uh, Long-Term Care. Madonna Care Community in Orleans has suffered repeated tragedies throughout COVID-19. Staff shortages and a lack of PPE have uh, led to a nightmare scenario. For months, family members called on the government to take concrete actions, but help didn't arrive for the 47 residents and two staff who lost their lives to COVID. The owners of Madonna have fired a senior vice president, and their CEO has resigned. Mr. Speaker, will the minister stand up and take her share of responsibility for the tragedy at Madonna and across Ontario? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for, for raising that issue. What is happening in, in many of our homes uh, is really requiring an integrated approach. And I want to say that our, our homes are moving out of outbreak. We have a few homes where there's one staff or one resident in, in some of the homes. There's actually no one in the home. Uh, with COVID. It is a staff member who is self-isolating at home. And I'm very grateful to all the, the teams that came to help Madonna, uh, the uh, partners, Ontario Health, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, the Royal Ottawa Hospital, the inspectors that have gone in, um, and that outbreak is resolved. So we are moving in the right direction. We are making progress. Were, was there a legacy of neglect from the previous Liberal government and the, uh, the NDP who supported that government? Yes. We have taken every measure and every tool, and we will continue to transition to a modern long-term care system. Yes, supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my, question, my supplementary is also for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The Premier promised an iron ring around long-term care facilities, and we know that that never happened. We called on the government to step in and take over uh, Madonna Community Care in Orleans, and that never happened. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 
Uh, I asked the minister for the scar scorecards for long-term care facilities so we could uh, provide assistance as she requested in solving the long-term care problem, and Mr. Speaker, that never happened. Ontarians are asking for a plan for long-term care to address a second wave, which we believe will happen. Mr. Speaker, will the minister commit to releasing her plan for a second wave of COVID-19 and long-term care, or will that be another, yet another thing that simply doesn't happen? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and, and thank you for that forward-looking question. I think it, is, it behooves us all to be prepared, to anticipate, to be adaptable and vigilant. That's what we're doing through our, our testing strategy. This is what we're doing through the stabilization plans for our long-term care homes and the staffing strategies that will be informed by the, the expert panel. Uh, these are all measures that will help our homes. We've heard around the world that this is a global a global situation in long-term care homes and that there is concern about a second wave. We take, we take that seriously and to heart, and measures are being taken uh, to address this issue. And I thank you for raising that. It's a very important point, and we will continue our work on this. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I know our government has been working with our municipal partners to ensure that we can keep Ontario's homeless population safe. As all members of this House know, the need, of, the need for physical distancing has changed the ways our shelters provide services. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain how our government has supported shelters provider Providers throughout this pandemic. Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the member for Don Valley North for his incredible advocacy and his work in his riding. He does a tremendous job for his constituents uh, every day. Uh, in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, my ministry invested $148 million into our communities through the Social Service Relief Fund. The funding is allowing our municipal service managers and our Indigenous program administrator to expand their services and their supports. This means securing hotels, increasing the pay of shelter workers, increasing funding that's available for rent banks and more. In fact, Speaker, in, in the members' uh, home city of Toronto, they're able to increase their rent bank by some $2 million. But we have other supports as well, Speaker, including the Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative. The program is funded 100 per cent by the province of Ontario. We're spending $338 million Response. this year, an increase from last year, to help people who are experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Thank you for the question. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Minister for that response. Speaker. It is uh, reassuring to know that this government is continuing to support our most uh, vulnerable through significant financial assistance. But we also know that it is taking more than money to help vulnerable Ontarians through these challenging times. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please further explain how as this government is working to keep our homeless Population safe. Thank you. Minister? Uh, speaker, our, our government implemented a risk assessment a survey for all homeless shelters, and we created the Ontario Shelter System Response Table with local officials. Uh, this let, uh, let us look at additional interventions as needed based on the individual shelter needs. We're already, we've already used the survey to ship emergency PPE to six of our service managers, and we'll continue uh, to keep everyone safe, and we'll continue to keep working with the shelters. Our government is also uh, continuing to prioritize COVID testing for people in congregate living settings like uh, homeless shelters. Circumstances, Speaker, are changing every day, and we need to continue to work to keep our most vulnerable safe. Thank you for the question. 
The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Not only are the Conservatives failing seniors in long-term care, but their choice to protect profits over big corporations, over the well-being of our seniors, is truly hurting families. In Hamilton, families are shocked with the news that continues to come out of the Roslyn Retirement Home. Rat feces, black mold were found in the kitchen. Police were called to investigate after staff accidentally left a senior alone there overnight after an investigation or evacuation. This week, we wrote to the Hamilton police asking them to consider expanding their investigation into this horrific retirement home. Will your government support this call? Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. This is a serious concern, and there's no excuse for what happened at that home. But I can assure you that the Retirement Homes Regulatory Authority Registrar has issued an order to um, revoke the license of the Rossland Retirement Residence in Hamilton. And after careful review and consideration of the information collected through inspections, complaints, and reports from the staff and the public, the registrar did make this serious decision, and I'm sure that there's more work that is going to be done because we need to protect our most vulnerable citizens, and clearly this did not happen. <laughs> And supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The horrendous conditions at this home shows just how bad things were allowed to get, first under the Liberals and now under the Conservatives. Families have been raising concerns at this home and others for months now, and the government should have revoked the license of this home weeks ago instead of just standing by and letting things get worse. Speaker, seniors built our province, and they deserve to retire and spend their final years in dignity, not spend it fighting for their lives in substandard care homes. Will the Deputy Premier commit today to taking profit out of seniors' care and commit to ensure this sort of thing never happens again? Mr. Health. Well, I can certainly agree with the member that the health and well-being of our seniors is of utmost priority to us. They did build the province, and they deserve uh, to be live their years in comfort and dignity and with at least the basic services that they need allowed for them and, and more than that. But I can assure the member that we are working with the Regulatory Homes Retirement Authority, the Ontario Retirement Communities Association, and other key stakeholders to make sure that, with respect to our seniors in retirement, retirement homes in other congregate living spaces to make sure that they are able to be provided with the uh, comfort and care that they absolutely deserve. Thank you very much. The next question, a member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> My question is for the Solicitor General. Correctional officers in Ontario perform a challenging but critically important job, working with a population that has complex needs, including at the Southwest Detention Centre near my riding. Staff in correctional facilities can never fully predict what any given day will bring, which is why it is important to ensure that they have the tools and resources they need to ensure our correctional facilities remain safe. I was pleased to see that Earlier this year, the Solicitor General announced an updated correctional foundational training program to better support incoming correctional officers. Can the, the uh, Solicitor General share with this House how her ministry is building off that announcement through further investments in frontline staff? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Chatham Kent Leamington for the question. You know, the, the years that you served in opposition working with the corrections uh, institutions and our staff we, has uh, really driven part of our desire to make sure that we do a better job. And as Solicitor General, I, along with my parliamentary assistant, the MPP for Cambridge, has heard from our frontline correctional staff about the challenges they face each and every day. As a result of these important conversations, I'm pleased to announce that our government is investing more than $500 million over five years to deliver real change in correctional facilities across Ontario. 
This major investment will support the hiring of more than 500 new staff to address ongoing challenges within the correction system. These new resources will also be used to modernize outdated infrastructure to support programming Response. within our institutions. By investing in people and infrastructure, we will create a better and safer environment. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and again, uh, thank you, Solicitor General, for your response. You know, this significant new financial investment is clearly an absolutely critical step in supporting Ontario's frontline correctional staff. Now, back to the minister. Over the last few months, the government has been working to address the challenges presented by COVID-19, and I know corrections is no exception. So can the Solicitor General share an update with this House about how her ministry has responded to the COVID-19 health emergency and whether those efforts are showing results? Again, the Solicitor General. It would be my pleasure, Speaker. Since COVID-19 arrived in Ontario, we've taken swift action across Ontario's 25 adult correctional facilities, and we continue to take further action to keep our staff and those in our custody safe. Just some of the measures implemented include proactive testing of all inmates, as well as all newly admitted inmates in conjunction with the local medical health units, temperature checks for all staff and visitors, working with our justice sector partners to proactively reduce the inmate population, as well as implement virtual courts with near universal uptake. Correctional facilities, like so many other congregate-based sectors in Ontario, have not been immune to COVID. However, thanks to the proactive and ongoing work of the dedicated staff in each of Ontario's correctional facilities, we continue to see results in limiting the potential spread of this virus. This includes the Ontario Correctional Institute, where I'm pleased Response. to report as early as this month, all active cases have been resolved. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is for the Acting Premier. Speaker, throughout this pandemic, the government has strengthened, not weakened, its ties with private long-term care corporations. These private care corporations hired former government staffers to lobby the government on their behalf. This raises serious doubts as to whether this government is serious about fixing our long-term care crisis. That's why constituents like Mary from London North Centre support the opposition's plan for an impartial find-and-fix inquiry. She wrote to me saying, it is unbelievable that our most vulnerable citizens have been experiencing these conditions for decades and nothing has been done. I want a full public inquiry. Anything less is an insult to seniors. Anything less than a find and fix inquiry ought to be criminal. My question is simple. Will the minister listen to Ontarians like Mary and commit to a public find and fix inquiry or will they continue to take advice from political insiders and lobbyists? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for, uh, for your question. If we look at the Public uh, Inquiry Act, it includes public commissions, and that's what we are committed to doing, making sure that we have transparency, public hearings, public, uh, a public report, we are making sure that this is public, and we are in the process of, of getting this together for July. And I want to touch on, on some of the issues surrounding the redevelopment. If we look at really the past decade, since 2011, only 611 beds were built. That is a shame, and that is one of the reasons why our ward beds and our long-term care homes in areas with high density of population, like the Toronto area, were so badly hit because of the density and the capacity in, in wardrooms. We know that that's part of the Response. issue. And the staffing crisis. So these are areas that need to be addressed. We need to have a, a, an independent, nonpartisan public commission. That is what we need. The supplementary question. Back to the Acting Premier. With all due respect, a commission is not impartial, and it is not nonpartisan. <laughs> Speaker, the Mount Hope Family Council wrote urgent letters to this government describing funding cuts, eroding resources, and management and staff doing their best but failing to meet needs. These letters were sent in November, December, March, and April. From this minister, silence. 
Not only is this government failing families in long-term care, their refusal to hire more full-time staff or pay PSWs a proper wage is making things worse for workers as well. Thelma, a registered nurse, wrote to me saying that long-term care homes should have to provide permanent work for PSWs. Consistency in staffing builds a better home and better relationships between residents and staff. Sherry, another Question. constituent, works in an Alzheimer's unit in long-term care and told me the staff-to-resident ratio is a joke. Ontario doesn't want to see long-term health care heroes like PSWs treated fairly. When is this government going to listen to frontline workers and increase the number of full-time PSW Thank you. positions so that our seniors Thank you. can get the care they deserve? <laughs> Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker. And I'm, I'm glad that the member opposite asks this question because that's exactly what our government was in the process of doing. We were addressing the staffing crises that existed in long-term care after many Order. years of neglect, many, many years of neglect. An expert panel to provide information so we could develop a staffing strategy. We introduced additional pay for our personal support workers in long-term care who are truly, truly heroes. There is no doubt about that. The good work that our government had begun through the Ministry of Long-Term Care, a new ministry that had only been in existence for a few short months before COVID-19 hit us. And I'm glad that you raised that question. The staffing issues was long neglected. The capacity issue Response. long neglected. And now our government is taking action on those, and we will continue to transition to a modern 21st century long-term care system. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have a question for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. As we all know, our airline and the aerospace uh, sector that services them have been hit especially hard by the effects of COVID-19, and it's had a terrible, devastating effect on the entire sector. Ontario is, home to, is lucky to be home to a $7.1 billion aerospace sector that supports over 44,000 good-paying quality jobs. Our aerospace sector generates $6 billion in annual sales, and parts made in Ontario are in virtually every passenger plane in the world. We need this sector to stay strong. Mr. Speaker, can the minister update the House on how our government is supporting Ontario's aerospace sector? of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker, and to uh, the member from Thornhill for the question. Our government strongly believes in supporting strategic business sectors and their workers. We will always stand up for the manufacturing sector in Ontario, including aerospace, and help manage the immediate impacts of COVID-19. We are working closely with the Ontario Aerospace Council, Downsview Aerospace Innovation and Research, and the federal government to promote the industry at home and abroad. This includes important skills training and development in Ontario's world-leading aerospace education institutions with over 40 degree and diploma programs in the field, and of course the unprecedented $17 billion relief plan that helped people and businesses during this challenge. Our government understands the challenges faced by the aerospace sector and many others, Response. and we will continue to work with our partners to protect and to strengthen aerospace jobs and investment. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, it's very, very positive to see that we have a government that is relentless in its support for advanced manufacturing and for our thousands of aeroplace sector workers. Our government's commitment to the aeroplace sector will be crucial in maintaining confidence, protecting jobs, and welcoming investments in the future. Again to the Minister, Mr. Speaker, can he update the House on steps Ontario is taking to support our aeroplace sector in these unprecedented times? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our government will always take a pro-jobs and pro-investment economic development approach. Actions taken by our government in, over the last 18 months have saved Ontario businesses over $2 billion in 2019, or I'm sorry, over $5 billion in 2019 and $5.4 billion in 2020. 
things like reducing WSIB premiums by over $2 billion, putting an investment allowance in place, saving business almost a billion dollars. Through our recovery plan, we are working closely with the aerospace and advanced manufacturing sectors to ensure Ontario emerges stronger than ever. As Premier Ford has said, Ontario will continue to be the manufacturing and innovation engine of Canada. We look forward to continue Response. working with our partners to build an even stronger aerospace sector here in Ontario for generations to come. Well, Thank you very much. Member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Today, people from all over Brampton and the Peel region are gathering to march against continued anti-black racism at the Peel District School Board, and I'll be joining them as well. Students, family, and faculty alike have been raising their concerns for years now. Public school board meetings have ended in harassment of parents and advocates, and black students continue to be hurt by racist incidents, lowered expectations, and cruel punishments. Last week, the Minister of Education said he would wait another two weeks after his investigator found that the board was not complying with his directives. Mr. Speaker, this isn't good enough. We need concrete action. When will the minister finally step up to the plate? Government House Leader. Uh, well, Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Minister has stepped up to the plate e immediately, and uh, I know that there is agreement on all sides of the House that what we've seen and heard from the Peel District School Board is completely unacceptable. I know all members are, are on agreement on that, and I congratulate the Minister who's going to be here, the, uh, the member across who will be. Uh, uh, showing that uh, today in his hometown. It's very, very important. Uh, the legislation, in fact, uh, forces the minister to wait two weeks. It's not something that the, uh, uh, the minister uh, can unilaterally do. As the, the member knows, there is a two-week waiting period after the report has been uh, uh, issued. The minister is, is doing that, uh, uh, following the, the, the legislation. But let me assure the member, and as he heads out to his community today, uh, that this government uh, is horrified by, by what it's seen, and we will make sure that that board stops and that uh, we all uh, uh, can be proud of uh, the Peel District School Board going forward. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question once again is for the Deputy Premier. It's clear we have a problem. When teachers can get away with making racist and anti-black comments, in the classroom and get nothing more than a slap on the wrist. The government's own investigators suggested that they had no confidence in the Peel District School Board's willingness to tackle systemic racism. Parents, city councillors, and organizations like the National Council of Canadian Muslims agree and are all calling for the resignation of the Peel Director of Education. And still, the minister waits. Mr. Speaker, why won't this government listen to the community and join with us in our fight to make our schools safer and more welcoming for all? Governor Sater. Uh, we have been uh, seized with this right uh, from the beginning, Mr. Speaker, not just in the, Peel, uh, uh, in the Peel Board, but since we're talking directly about the Peel Board, and I know the member is going out uh, later today, as he, as he mentioned, the Minister of Education uh, has taken direct action on this, as the member suggested. Uh, in, his, in his question, uh, we sent in an investigator. We have received a report by the terms of legislation passed by the members of this House. The government has a responsibility to wait two weeks to allow the board to respond. We are not going to break the law. We are going to follow the rules, follow the law. But let me assure this member that this minister, this government, and I know all members of this House will not stand for what, we, what we've heard and what we've seen in that report. We will fix the Peel District School Board. We will make it a board that we can be proud of, whether they want it or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.